Hey guys, Tom here from the Investing with Tom YouTube channel. Welcome back to the channel. If you enjoyed today's video, hit like, hit subscribe, and that way you can see future videos as well. So over the past week or so, there's been a lot of news come out and a lot of things that I've had a bunch of messages and kind of requests to make a video on. Uh, and basically the three big ones are A2 Milk came out with their half year sort of earnings update and an updated outlook for the rest of 2021. Uh, the market didn't like it and the stock got hammered. It was down about 15% in a day. Uh, the other thing we've had is Phil Town has come out with a portfolio update. He had to make a filing with the SEC. So we can now see the holdings in Phil Town's Rule 1 fund as of the end of December 2020. And the third thing is that just last night, uh, as I'm recording this, Monish Prabhai released a new talk, a new uh, Q&A session with students. So in this video, I want to try and cover all three of those topics. This may well be like my longest video I've ever recorded, uh, but I'll be sure to make timestamps and things along the bottom and down in the description. So if you want to jump forward to any kind of key parts that you're interested in hearing about, feel free to do that. Otherwise, sit back, relax, grab your popcorn, grab a drink, and let's get straight into it. Okay, so let's get straight into it and start out with an update for the A2 Milk Company. Now, there's a couple of key things that I want to cover uh, in this A2 Milk update. Uh, I'm not going to go through sort of the overall business and kind of what A2 does. Uh, we'll obviously touch on aspects of that throughout this update, but I'd already have two or three videos on the A2 Milk Company uh, on the channel. So feel free to look that up. You'll see my sort of full overview of the company. Uh, I think I first did an, an analysis and valuation probably close to two years ago when I said, you know, it looked expensive at the time and the price has then gone up a lot and now it's come down even more and it's been kind of an interesting one to follow. Um, so the two kind of key things I want to cover is firstly, what happened on this earnings call that caused the stock to go down 15% in a day uh, and give you some of my thoughts about the future for A2 Milk moving forward. And the other thing I want to touch on is an update on my intrinsic value calculations. That's something I always like to do whenever we get some updated outlooks and updated numbers for some of these companies. Uh, so those are two things we'll cover with A2 Milk, so let's get straight into it. And as always, this isn't investment advice. Uh, do your own research, make your own decisions. Don't let me influence your buy and sell decisions with the A2 Milk company or any other company for that matter. So uh, in terms of the update for the A2 Milk company, so this was the earnings release of the first half of their 2021 uh, numbers. If we've got any US viewers, uh, companies in New Zealand don't update quarterly like the US companies do. They only do two updates a year typically. Uh, so this was their first half 2021 update and this was also the first earnings call that David Bordalassi the new CEO at A2 Milk uh, has come out and done uh, not the best start I must say uh, but certainly not his fault he's only like two or three weeks into the job so you can't really blame him for a full half of pain for the A2 Milk company so here's what happened basically uh, the history of A2 Milk is that they have been this hugely successful growth story in New Zealand and um, They've grown to the point where they're um, around, or at least when their share price was a little bit higher, probably close to double what it is now. Um, they were the largest company by market cap in New Zealand, and they'd been growing revenue at around 50% per year compounded for the last seven or eight years. That growth rate has slowed down, and we'll get into that shortly, um, but they'd had grown basically from nothing to being this enormous company by New Zealand standards. And they've done that essentially by partnering with Sinlay, which is one of the major milk producers here in New Zealand, and producing A2 Milk branded products, typically infant formula, but also liquid milk and some other products as well. Uh, and they basically market the potential health benefits of milk with specifically just the A2 protein over milk with uh, the A1 and A2 proteins, which is what you typically get when you buy milk from your local supermarket. So... Uh, in terms of the update for this half, revenue for the company in the first half of 2021 versus the first half of 2020 was down 16%. So we've gone from a business that has a 50% compounded growth rate to a company that now has dropped their revenue 16% versus the same half last year. Um, and there was a whole bunch of other stuff that was down. EBITDA was down, net profit after tax, earnings per share, 
and infant nutrition product sales which is obviously a big driver of their business was also down so what actually happened well basically uh, there's two core drivers that have really caused this poor performance uh, for the A2 milk company and in my mind whether or not you think that this drop in share price for A2 is an opportunity or not uh, really comes down to whether you think that these two issues for the A2 milk company are temporary or permanent. Now, um, basically they had two channels to market that were disrupted quite handily. So uh, the first one is their CBEC channel and the second one is their Daigo or reseller channel. So CBEC uh, simply stands for cross-border e-commerce. The Daigo or reseller channel is basically where uh, there's sort of local people buying products in Australia or New Zealand and then reselling those products to people in China, for example. And both of those channels have been quite weak, particularly the Daigo channel in Australia and New Zealand. Now, that channel specifically, revenue was down from $460 million to $317 million, and that is a massive proportion of their business. The Australia New Zealand business is the biggest kind of component of the company that there is. Um, so they had massive issues there, and it was really caused by lockdowns, particularly in Australia. So it really stopped people from going into stores, buying the A2 milk products, and then uh, reselling that overseas to sort of make money. So um, that in my mind is potentially a short-term issue, but it has caused some problems in terms of growth for the A2 milk business business uh, they've shrunk their revenue in this half and the other thing it's caused is quite large levels of inventory they have about 50 million dollars of extra inventory versus where they were at at the same point last year uh, simply because in the early days of lockdown they saw some potential supply chain issues so they made sure that they had sufficient inventory to meet uh, the, the demand that they expected uh, but really the the demand just hasn't turned up uh, so they've got a lot of product kind of sitting on the sidelines right now but there was certainly some good news uh, the first good news is that market share in China was actually up so even on uh, sales that overall had dropped quite a bit the market share in the segments that the A2 milk company competes in was actually up so that's certainly a positive sign uh, the other thing is that the US business experienced quite strong growth now that is a minor component of A2 milk's business right now uh, but it's a region where they've got a lot of runway for growth because it's still fairly early days for the US component of the company and the final update for A2 is that they came out and basically downgraded their guidance or their outlook for the rest of 2021 financial year. Uh, and the guidance update was basically this. So they now expect revenue in the ballpark of $1.4 billion. That's down from their previous guidance of 1.475, uh, which is down from what they did in 2020 at $1.73 billion. So quite a significant downgrade versus 2020, a sort of minor downgrade since the latest one, but a downgrade nonetheless. Uh, the other downgrade that they had was their EBITDA margins. So previously, uh, if we take those margins and apply that percentage to the revenue to calculate an EBITDA number, uh, previously they were expecting around $406 million in EBITDA. Again, that's down from about $550 million in EBITDA that they did in 2020 uh, and their latest guidance is all the way down to 350 million dollars so now the guidance or the outlook for 2021 for revenue uh, is expected to come in at a 19 percent decrease versus 2020 and the EBITDA is expected to experience about a 37 percent decrease versus 2020. So how do all these changes, in my personal opinion, uh, impact the intrinsic value for the A2 Milk Company? We saw that the share price on this news dropped about 15%. Uh, it's probably down about 50% or more now from all-time highs a year or so ago. Uh, so is this a buying opportunity? Is it something we should be selling? Uh, again, that's not a decision that I'm going to make for you, but I'm going to give you my thoughts on how this potentially can impact the intrinsic value of the business. So I've updated some numbers here to give you basically sort of four different scenarios for the company. Now, the first scenario we're gonna look at is uh, if we have the A2 milk company hit their 
2021 updated guidance which is quite a bit lower than what they had in 2020 and then they basically return to growth after that point but lower growth that they've done in the past so um, in previous uh, valuations I've expected the A2 milk company to grow in the sort of low mid to low 20 percent a year kind of range which is a very high growth rate but compared to what they've done in the past I thought that was reasonable at the time now the second scenario is that basically the A2 milk company hits these numbers we then have a year where they sort of bounce back to where they were in 2020 and then they start growing again from that kind of regular base so in the first scenario they kind of have this dip in earnings from 2020 to 2021 and then they have sort of lower growth off that lower base second scenario is they bounce back and still have the lower growth so that's the first two scenarios the second two is that they again have that low base uh, but they then return to higher growth uh, and the fourth scenario is that they bounce back and they have higher growth so we're going from kind of uh, not so optimistic to a little bit more optimistic as we kind of work our way through these valuations. First scenario in sort of the lower base, so earnings drop and then they sort of grow slowly back off that lower baseline. Uh, I'm coming out with an intrinsic enterprise value of roughly $6 billion. If we, can, if we compare that to the current enterprise value of A2 Milk, that's also about $6 billion. Uh, if we expect a bounce back and then lower growth from a sort of more typical base, I come out with about $7.5 billion roughly, which is about implies about a 19, 20% discount to intrinsic value right now. Uh, if we have a low base and then they return to normal, sort of higher levels of growth, I get to about $8.3 billion and a 27% discount to intrinsic value. And finally, if the stars sort of align and we get this bounce back to a more regular earnings and we also get more normal growth, then I'm coming out at an intrinsic enterprise value of about 9.2 billion, which again implies about a 34% discount to intrinsic value. Now again, certainly take those numbers with a grain of salt, but that's sort of ballpark where I'm landing at the moment. I think a lot of people will often get these, you know, lower levels of earnings and then assume that that's kind of like a typical year and sort of run a discounted cash flow off that base. I think it's important to try and sort of normalize your base here, particularly if you're running some sort of valuation, some sort of discounted cash flow, and you're you know, taking a current earnings amount and then you're growing that out at some percentage into the future. Uh, the numbers that you arrive on are gonna be highly influenced by, of course, the percentages that you use for growth, but also by the starting number. So that starting number does has to have to be realistic, and that's kind of why I've used the examples that I have. So it's gonna be really interesting to see how this one plays out. Um, none of those scenarios really got me to the big 50% margin of safety that I'm often looking for. Uh, but there is potentially a margin of safety if you expect some um, you know, good bounce back from A2 Milk in the next couple of years, and then expect them to return to more typical growth moving forward after that. Okay, so the second topic for today's video is that Phil Town recently came out with a new SEC filing that we can use to uh, see his holdings in his Rule 1 fund. Now, uh, Phil Town does report both the stock and option holdings in his portfolio, which is very interesting, uh, and he also actually reports cash. So with these updates that we get for Phil Town and his Rule 1 fund, we actually get a lot more information than we would typically get in something like a 13F filing that we get for many of these larger investors so um, there are a few kind of key stories out of this Phil Town portfolio update and I have to give a very large shout out to Brad Kellner for uh, basically taking this really ugly uh, SEC filing and turning it into something readable uh, I'm basically using his spreadsheet for this video where he has kind of compiled Phil Town's holdings from the latest SEC filing compared that to previous filings and we can kind of see whether he's been buying or selling or adding brand new stocks altogether so a few key stories out of this one for me. And the first main one is that Phil Town is still very, very heavy on cash. We've seen and basically all of his previous filings that Phil Town has a huge percentage of his portfolio on cash. He talks about a lot on his podcast, sort of sitting in cash and waiting for opportunities. And he's doing exactly that in his fund right now. He currently has about $119 million under management 
but he has about $40 million worth of that uh, in cash. So uh, right around a third of the portfolio is in cash, a massive percentage. And it means that uh, if the market does come down or individual companies for whatever reason do have their share prices drop a lot, uh, Filltown is in a very, very good position to try and capitalize on that opportunity. So let's go through the holdings top to bottom. There are nine individual companies in here as well as an ETF and as well as the cash. So let's go through from the top holding all the way to the bottom and actually holding that fill town has interestingly exited altogether. Uh, let's go through that now. So the first holding we have is Bank OZK. Now this is about 14.7% of fill town's portfolio based off current market prices. And this for a long time, uh, for the past couple of updates, I believe has been Phil Town's biggest position. So he has made a change to it in the last quarter. He reduced his share count by about 18%. Uh, but it still makes up about $17.5 million worth of his portfolio or about 14.7%. Next we have CF Industries, which basically manufacture urea fertilizer from natural gas, uh, nitrogen based fertilizer that farmers use essentially. Um, and they are basically the low cost producer of that fertilizer. They have access to very low cost natural gas and it basically gives them a sort of sustainable pricing advantage, even though they're in sort of like a cyclical commodity type industry. So with CF Industries, we saw that the share count went up 26%. He now has 295,000 shares. Uh, that's up from 235,000, which is up from 111,000 a couple of quarters ago. So an additional 26% for CF Industries, that's now about close to a $14 million position and about 11.6% of the portfolio. Okay, so the next two stocks on the list are the ones where the most substantial additions were made. Uh, so the first one is Boeing that increased in holding by about 176%. So big increase there. It's now $11 million position or about 9% of the portfolio. And next we have a, a new stock, ticker symbol HII, which is Huntington Ingle Industries. And this is a brand new stock for Phil Town. Now, when I say it's a brand new stock, this is the first time that he's owned shares in it when he's disclosed his portfolio. Uh, but interestingly, I did see in a previous filing that he had actually sold put options on HII. Now Huntington Ingalls basically manufacture warships for the US military. They are very niche down into kind of that specific sector. Uh, and that's not really a area in my circle of competence at all maybe i could get it there who knows uh but nonetheless uh phil town has got that in there and it's now slightly under seven percent of his portfolio so boeing and huntington ingle industries are the two stocks where he's made the biggest additions in the recent quarter okay so next on this list are five stocks and one etf which phil town has owned previously and has made zero change to in the last quarter. So just to quickly walk through those, those are Gildan Activewear, uh, again, like a low cost producer of clothing, basically. Uh, Armada Hoffler, which is a REIT, I believe. Um, both of those positions make up about 5%. Next, we've got the Spider Gold ETF. Now, Phil Town has talked about gold a little bit. Uh, I've talked about my view on this in the past that I kind of see this as like a cash placeholder for Phil Town. I think if stocks got cheap enough and the right opportunities showed up to where he wanted to basically get fully invested and put all his cash to work, I would see that gold ETF probably disappearing. That would be my guess, but that's still in there. Uh, Sturm, Ruger & Co. And we also have Berkshire Hathaway and Alter Beauty. Um, all sort of four of those final positions make up about three, three and a half percent of the portfolio. And the final change for Phil Town, and the one that really caught mine and Brad's attention, uh, was the only uh, other sale, aside from the, the trimming of Bank OZK that Phil Town did, the only other sale, which is SRG, Seritage Growth Properties, uh, and he reduced that by 100%. He's fully out of SRG in this particular portfolio. I should mention that uh, Phil Town did do a Facebook live stream a while ago when the uh, when it came out that the CEO was resigning from Seritage Growth Properties, he basically did a Facebook live stream and said he still likes Seritage, uh, but the uncertainty had caused him to sell out of it in one of his portfolios. So 
My guess is this is the one portfolio he was talking about, and he potentially still holds SRG elsewhere, but hard to say on that particular front without asking him and him telling us, obviously. So uh, he's fully out of SRG. It's kind of surprising because he was very bullish on SRG. He thought it was trading substantially under liquidation value, and he thought that the intrinsic value of SRG was going to go up substantially over the next 10 years. But it is what it is. He's out of SRG 100%, and that is Phil Town's latest portfolio update. Okay, and the third and final topic of this particular video, which probably could have been three videos, <laughs> judging by that, the length of all these topics, but nonetheless, uh, you're getting it all at once. So uh, the third topic is a recent talk that Monus Probri did. So Monus Probri recently did a roughly hour-long Q&A session with uh, the Babson College Fund. And uh, unlike many of Monus Probri's talks, there wasn't like an initial monologue or anything that he did. Kind of just jumped straight to Q&A, but nonetheless, there were some, you know, gold nuggets of wisdom in this one. A lot of it is really stuff that I've heard Probri talk about before. But it reinforces a lot of these lessons uh, and I'm going to go through and basically give you my highlights from some of the questions that these students asked Monish Pabrai. Okay, so the first question that was put to Pabrai was uh, this: basically the story of how value investing has uh, underperformed growth investing over the past several years. And uh, he basically wanted to gather Pabrai's thoughts on that. And basically Pabrai said that uh, value and growth are two sides of the same coin. And uh the questioner here is quite right when you look at value versus growth on kind of a quantitative basis if you were to use some simple metric like a low price to book or a low price to earnings as defining value uh then those stocks have actually underperformed uh, underperformed a lot of the sort of high flying growth stocks in the past few years uh, but that's not how Monish Pabrai defines value. Monish Pabrai defines value as the present value of all the future cash flows that a business will distribute. And if you can buy into businesses at a substantial discount to the present value of those future cash flows, then that is value investing. So you can buy into high growth stocks, you can buy into low growth stocks, you can buy into declining uh, businesses, and basically all of that can be value investing as long as you're paying a substantial discount to the present value of future cash flows. So growth is, a, is an important factor in value and trying to compare you know, value and growth as if they're two separate things doesn't make a lot of sense. And the other thing to keep in mind is that uh, there is also a difference between a growing business and a growing stock or a growing investment. And he brings up the example of Microsoft, which I've talked about on the on the channel a few times as well. Uh, and he basically brings up the example of where Microsoft in the year 2000 was very, very overvalued if you compared it to the present value of the future cash flows for Microsoft. Now, Microsoft, the business, went on to do very, very well over the next 10, 15 years. Uh, but the stock was basically flat from the year 2000 to the year 2014 because you overpaid for the stock so it's all about present value of future cash flows uh, when you're doing you know good valuation and, and becoming a value investor uh, and that's what Pabrai is deeply focused on the next question Pabrai got was around uh, having the conviction to hold through 2008. Now, um, Pabrai, if you don't know, had performed extremely well from 1999 when he started his fund through to 2008. He then had his portfolio go, go down about 60 or 70 percent at the bottom through the financial crisis. And he was basically asked, you know, what he did through that period to uh, continue holding on to those stocks and not get emotional or fearful and, you know, sell out of those businesses. So here's a few things that he said. The first thing is he said he always focuses on the intrinsic value of those companies. And he knew that in 2008, uh, even with very uh, pessimistic assumptions for what he thought his portfolio companies might do out into the future, his portfolio was selling at a substantial discount to intrinsic value. So uh, he doesn't try to worry about irrational pricing. He sees that as an opportunity. He talks about buying a uh, sort of a basket of commodity businesses at that time when prices were just at unusually low levels. And um, basically all of those businesses turned into at least doubles and many of them were multi-baggers, five, six, seven, eight X's uh, from the bottom in 2008. 
So the first thing was to focus on intrinsic value. The second thing was don't use leverage. Um, if you're in a position where you are levered, when things are going up, things can look really good. But when things are going down, you often get a call from your banker <laughs> basically asking him to sell your stocks, sell your assets at the worst possible time. So that's not a position you want to be in. And the third thing he said is kind of a quote that is stuck with him and an idea that he's mentioned a few times and it basically says that character and health are far more important than wealth so um, as long as he had his character and as long as he had uh, his health through 2008 having some sort of downward fluctuation in his portfolio was not a huge concern for him uh, particularly when he views it as kind of a temporary loss in wealth on paper <laughs> he still thought all those companies were substantially undervalued and he saw that as an opportunity more than anything Okay, next up, we've got a few tips from Pabrai on portfolio management uh, and how he kind of views that. And he basically said that uh, you shouldn't view yourself as a portfolio manager when you're investing money. You should view yourself as a silent partner in a business, as having ownership in a business, and that idea will dictate to a large extent how you manage your portfolio. So. Um, he said that someone like Charlie Munger would say if you've got three stocks in your portfolio, that's more than enough. And Pabrai actually said that in his personal accounts, he's never really in more than three stocks. Sometimes he's in as little as one stock. And um, he runs very concentrated, but he did mention that in his uh, fund where he's managing OPM, other people's money, he has promised investors that he will never go to more than 10% in one individual company at cost. Now, if it goes up, you know, after he's bought it and it's substantially more than 10%, he views that as fine and he tries not to sell things just because they get to, you know, 40, 50% of the portfolio. Um, but that's how he views it. He says he'll never go more than 10% in one idea in the fund, but he's happy to go far more concentrated than that in his personal accounts. The next topic that Pabrai moved to was uh, basically the story of the Nifty 50. Now, this was basically an era in, I believe, the 60s and 70s where uh, the prevailing kind of thought process at that time was let's just buy the best businesses possible and over the long term we should be okay and um, that is you know a reasonable idea I suppose but uh, the thing that you've got to make sure that you uh, don't ignore is the price of those companies so what happened through that nifty 50 era is that many of these businesses got to 50 60 70 80 PEs uh, they got very very expensive and you know these included really high quality businesses that are still growing today like McDonald's like Coca-Cola um, but the fact that people overpaid for those companies really deteriorated uh, you know the returns and it ended up that the nifty 50 really did dramatically underperform the overall index uh, simply because they paid too much for those companies but he did mention that there is a small footnote at the bottom of this nifty 50 story that uh you know there's a bit of controversy on and it's basically whether or not walmart was included in the nifty 50 and he told the really interesting story that you know if you had these 50 companies in your portfolio uh, and one of them was walmart it had its two percent allocation you know uh 100 portfolio spread across 50 companies you got two percent in each he said that if Walmart was included in that portfolio, even though it was only a slither, over, even though it was only that 2% um, piece of the pie, that would have caused the Nifty 50 to outperform just about any index available. So he basically concluded that if you can buy great businesses at reasonable prices, you're likely to do well. If you buy great businesses at really high prices, you probably won't do that well. And if you buy an exceptional business and you know you have nine out of ten companies in your portfolio do okay but you have one do absolutely spectacular that can be all you need to sort of propel yourself in the strata into the stratosphere in terms of your long-term rate of return next up he spent a little bit of time talking about his turkish company i won't talk about this too much because he's mentioned it in previous talks uh, but basically the idea was he bought that business for about five cents on the dollar and he was able to do that because of currency fears and so on um, and it's a business that he wants to hold for a long period of time he thinks the intrinsic value is probably half a billion dollars he bought it at a market cap of like 20 million dollars 
uh, and he thinks that that intrinsic value of half a billion will probably triple over the next 10 years because of the great management team at the helm. So now he's basically developed a strategy with that company where he's just going to sit back and watch paint dry. He said, if you really love to watch paint dry, then this investing business is a great business for you. Uh, and that's what he's going to, you know, that's what he plans to do for that particular Turkish company at this point. Uh, next, Monas Prabhai got a question that he gets in almost t every talk he ever does, and that was, um, you know, what's your opinion on all this macroeconomic stuff, money printing, interest rates, uh, you know, foreign debt levels, and all this sort of stuff. Um, and Pabrai gave the same answer that he loves to give every single time, which micro trumps macro every time. You know, if he went back to the Walmart example and said, uh, Walmart would have done spectacularly well even if there was some financial crisis in Russia or interest rates went really high and then really low and then there was a bunch of inflation or just about anything could happen and the Walmart business would still very do very well. Uh, just about anything could happen and the uh the turkish business would do very very well he had massive turkish lira currency devaluation which has caused the turkish lira to drop about 40 percent against the us dollar since Kobrai made an investment uh but the investment's been like a 10x so it doesn't matter <laughs> he's still doing extremely well uh and he said that there's a lot of noise and a lot of stuff that just goes on where you can basically just sit back and watch it for entertainment purposes, but it really shouldn't be part of your investing strategy. He sort of sees the Teslas and the Bitcoins and the GameStops of the world as a bit of a sideshow and something that, again, is kind of entertaining, but it really shouldn't be a key part of anyone's investment strategy, paying too much attention to overall macro trends or you know key pockets of the market where there's a lot of hype and a lot of FOMO and all that sort of stuff. So a few final topics that Monash Pabrai touched on. Uh, the next one was circle of competence, and he basically said that uh, it's not the size of the circle that matters, but it is staying within the circle. And your, your circle of competence, the things that you understand, will naturally kind of expand over time. And as long as you stay within that circle, you'll do well. So uh, next up, we had Korea and Turkey. He mentioned a couple of stories of how he basically sources investments. So... Uh, Warren Buffett has a famous quote around basically starting with the A's and going through every single company. Uh, Monish Prabhai likes to speed that process up somewhat. <laughs> and he talks about having friends of Monish all around the world uh, and a couple of key ones in both Korea and Turkey. And he basically contacted those people and said, hey, do you mind if I come to Turkey or come to Korea and visit you? And, you know, we just hang out, we drink tea, we eat great food, and then I visit some of your portfolio companies. And they said, Monish, we'd love for that to happen. It'd be great to hang out with you. Uh, and this is a great example of how having a really good reputation like Monish Prabhai does uh, can actually make you a lot of money, can help you identify some of these opportunities. And he has friends in some of these really cheap stock markets around the world, and it's been able to allow him to find a lot of really great investment opportunities. And the final thing that Monish Prabhai mentioned was uh, kind of a really nice way to wrap it up, I think. He basically got a question uh, essentially asking for a stock tip. They said, you know, Monish, what's your best idea right now? Uh, and he said he's going to duck that question. And it sort of turned into this discussion around really the three main variables that lead someone to becoming wealthy over time. And he said that those three variables are the amount of capital uh, you start with and the amount of capital you continue to contribute uh, you know, into your savings and your compounding and your investing. Uh, the second thing is the length of runway. How long do you have to invest? Uh, you know, are you 10 years old, 20 years old, 30, 40, 50, 60 years old? And how long are you going to live? How long do you have to invest and, and compound that wealth? And the second thing, and sorry, the third thing is the rate of return. And basically those three variables you can play around with and try to figure out, you know, how can we pull some of these levers in order to maximize our long-term wealth creation? And he said that, you know, simply giving out a stock tip, that's uh, the juice is kind of going to get squeezed out of that stock tip probably in the next three or four years. And that's not really something that's going to help you over an extended period of time. 
what's really going to help you is trying to focus on uh, all those three variables, trying to focus on saving as much money and investing as much money as you can, which is the amount of capital contributed. Uh, you know, living a long and healthy, healthy, happy life is going to extend the runway. And then the rate of return, uh, you know, there's a few things that you can do over an extended period of time. But getting one stock tip today is not going to be the thing that helps you. What you really need is a long term investing framework that can help you produce strong returns over that entire investing time frame. And he said, frankly, if you just buy an S&P 500 index and continue to contribute to that consistently and reinvest your dividends and so on, you really don't need a huge rate of return if you've got the long runway and you've got the consistent contributions on your side. You can do uh, both of those things well and still just have a modest rate of return and come out the other end with uh, more money than you will ever know what to do with. So compounding financially is all about the number of doubles that you can create. And those are basically the three variables that help you to control the number of doubles that you know snowball wealth over time. So those are some of my key lessons from Monish Prabhai, and that's it for all three of those topics today. That's an update from the A2 Milk Company. Uh, we talked about an updated Phil Town portfolio, and those are some of the key lessons and takeaways from Monish Prabhai's latest talk. So if you've made it to this point in the video, I thank you massively for getting to this point. Uh, please hit like and hit subscribe if you haven't already. But that's it for me today, and I will see you in the next one. Cheers.